Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rationable. Today, we're going to have a very special conversation with Janice Boynton. Am I pronouncing that all right? You are. Yes. Oh, wonderful. All right. So Janice is here to tell us something about facilitated communication, which is something we should all be very aware of, especially if we have someone in our family or friends who is probably autistic or has some sort of a verbal disability problem. It is quite remarkable, the kind of things that I've learned over the last few days that I've been looking into this. And Janice has been doing a lot of great work in promoting skepticism about facilitated communication, which we will find out about today. Welcome, Janice. Thank you so much for joining us on Rationable. Oh, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. I wanted to start off with, first of all, what is facilitated communication? Facilitated communication, originally, it, it morphed over the years, but originally it was designed as a communication technique to work with profoundly impaired clients, usually autistic people or people with developmental delays. And the original form of facilitated communication came in the support of a client at the wrist or the elbow or the shoulder to, to help type on a letter board or a keyboard. So basically the facilitator, which would be the helper, would hold on to the client's wrist, support it lightly while the person points, and then they move towards a letter board to type. And the whole idea was that by providing emotional support, you were able to help the person focus their attention on typing. I see. So what are the kinds of conditions where this is used? I've seen primarily a lot of a lot of talk, especially among autistic people and children. But are there any other disorders that they that this is used for? Yeah, anybody with a profound communication difficulty. So people with developmental delays, some originally people with cerebral palsy, that kind of person, but mostly it's associated with profound autism. I see. And from what I heard about from your talk at Skeptical, which we were both in Skeptical giving talks on the uh, the white papers, but from what I heard, you said you used to be a facilitator, so to speak. I did. I was. In the United States, facilitated communication started being popular around 1990. And mm -hmm. Douglas Bicklin brought it over from Australia, where Rosemary Crosley kind of invented it. There's been forms of this throughout the years, covered and then debunked and then discovered again. And I was teaching at that time, I was a speech language clinician, and I was teaching in a school where the student that I had came with a facilitator. So I actually learned how to do facilitated communication first through that facilitator. And then I went to a training at the University of Maine, which is our local university that was hosting workshops on facilitated communication. Yeah. Did you personally work with some of these people and facilitate communication for them? I did. Yeah. I worked with, actually, I only worked with one client and she was pretty much nonverbal. I don't know that she's, she, even after I left, I don't know that she ever was able to communicate verbally in a functional way. She was able to say some sounds and point to things and make her needs known in nonverbal ways, but she wasn't very verbal. And that seemed to be the, the ideal client to work or student to work with facilitated communication. I do want to hear your story, if you're okay with sharing it, <laughs> your journey and how you discovered this and how it made you feel, what it made you do, and how have you progressed from that? That's like a 30-year journey, but I'll try to make it short. <laughs> it it's actually quite surprising that I'm still talking about it in, in 2022 when it was debunked in early 1990. So that's mm -hmm. part of the that's part of the mystery or the appeal of facilitated communication in a way. Like I said, my client came into the school system with a facilitator. The first thought was to give that person the benefit of the doubt. It was a brand new technique. It was, it was marketed as something that was going to, it was revolutionizing the way people felt about people with autism or what they knew about autism. And so we started using it. There was some rough guidelines about using it and we followed those you 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 look for hallmarks like 
unique spellings or the person is all of a sudden able to come up with unexpected conversation, all typed, that kind of thing. We weren't really sure what we had, and that's p- partly why I got involved with it. I was a speech person, so we thought it was a language issue. So I probably should be exploring facilitated communication with her when I worked with her. And it, the guidelines, like I know this now, but I didn't know it at the time. Mm-hmm. The guy, Part of the guidelines is that you use information that the facilitator already knows. So you're using to get responses from the client, typed responses from the client. You do fill in the blanks or, or multiple choice kind of activity, pointing to a picture. Here's a picture of a cat. Can you point to, and there's three pictures as a tree and a house and a cat. Can you point to the picture with the cat? And so you hold the person at the wrist and they point to the cat and you're like, wow, that's really cool. She knows how to point to a cat. And eventually you're getting words and sentences and you do little tests. Like maybe she wants a, maybe there's a hamburger or pizza for lunch. And you say, what would you like for lunch? And they type out pizza and they grab the pizza for lunch great, you know, that in your head, that kind of confirms these communications. It's a really slow process. The person essentially, I know now, and I'll give it away, is the facilitator is teaching the person how to point on cue. It's really what happens. But you don't know that as a facilitator. You go in not really realizing that. And they don't teach you that kind of stuff in the workshops. They they tell you to presume competence. So you're not looking... You're not supposed to test the person. You're not really looking at your own actions. Or you might say in your head, I moved the person's hand that mm-hmm. time, but I won't next time. Uh-huh. And, and then over time, you're getting sentences and having these conversations. And you, what happens with the facilitator is you spend less and less time thinking about your own actions. And you're involved in what seems to be a conversation. And it's quite exciting. All of a sudden, this person that didn't have any verbal communication skills is typing out words and sentences and giving their thoughts and cracking jokes and that kind of stuff. It's quite an amazing kind of a heady process when you think, oh, and the other thing is that the whole facilitated communication process is about building trust with the person. So it might not work for one teacher, but it, all of a sudden it works for you and that person must trust you for some reason. Like that's the connection you make in your head. So it kind your, of guides you into a position where you just assume where you're not questioning yourself, you're not questioning the method, but you already have a bias going in that this person is already mentally completely competent to communicate by themselves and you're just helping them along. And True. so you're just, it's a, it's an exercise in self-deception as well as deceiving everybody else as well, right? It certainly is. Yeah. And the thing is when it works for one teacher or like I could spot when the other facilitator was moving the person's hand and think, oh, I that didn't seem like that was right. It seems like she's moving the person's hand, but did I, I didn't see it in myself. So it's harder to see your own errors. And if you've got a bias, you're willing to say, oh, she didn't mean to, but she won't the next time. There's a lot of rationalization with making it work. And the other thing that this part has actually grown over since 1990s, and we didn't really know what was happening. But now the idea that the person has fully intact intelligence and communication skills and literacy skills like they don't need to be taught they just know it they've somehow absorbed it from the environment i've heard parents describing it as well i didn't know my student my my son or daughter knew politics but they must have picked it up from listening to the radio or that kind of thing so the environment there's a lot of fooling yourself it's not how literacy is learned or language skills are learned but you want it to work you're motivated to, uh, I think the psychics call remember the hits and forget the misses. So the times that it feels like you got a right answer, you're like, oh, see, it does work. And yeah. the times, say the lunch example again, uh-huh. say she typed out pizza, but she grabbed a hamburger instead of a pizza. And you're like, oh, she just changed her mind and she has a right to change her mind. So the communication is still accurate. Yeah, pizza was still accurate, but by the time from the room to the cafeteria, she changed her mind and she wanted a hamburger instead. So there's a lot of that. Yeah, 
So how did you figure out what was going on that you were being deceived or how did you discover this? Yeah, okay, this is a really hard part of my personal story and, and but it's happened it's been replicated many times including with the person from Australia that actually invented FC this situation happened. In my case, when you go to the workshops, they tell you that that there may be a, once these people start communicating, they may also communicate abuses from that they've gone through or anger or whatever. So in my case, she started hitting me and I didn't really know why. And I was thinking everything was working fine. And in my head, I was maybe something's happening at home. And I don't know whether this was a conversation that we had with, I had with other staff members or whatever. So once that seed is planted, it can be a dangerous thing. And in my case, it turned to allegations of abuse against the family. And so oh. then we were like, okay, what do we do with this information? And it, we talked about it and it went on for several weeks before we actually did anything about it. And if that was a typically speaking person, we would report it to, as a, we were mandatory reporters, we would report it to our Department of Health Services, which is what we ended up doing. And so that whole process brought out, and they were all based, it's hard to admit it, and this is why facilitators don't like to be tested, but of the all of the allegations were based on my, my information, the information that I had or made up during... And you don't do it intentionally. You're thinking it's coming from the other person, but they ask you in a DHS interview, who hurt you or where were you hurt or that kind of stuff. And your mind just fills in those blanks. And I, so it got to a point where the lawyers were involved and the guardian at Lightum, who was the person that would, the lawyer that was looking after the children in this case, decided we better find out who's doing the communicating. This is a new technique. We better check that first before we know how much weight to give the allegations. Because if something's happening at home, that's bad. But if it's facilitator generated, that's also bad. And we need to know that difference. So through a series of events, and again, that you're taught in the workshops not to test it. So I was in a position of, okay, I understand the severity of the situation and the effects this might have on the family, but I'm also told not to test facilitated communication. So what do I do? And I ended up deciding to test it, to go ahead and test it. So they did double blind testing, which meant that the information that I that both of us were shown during the testing was blind to me. I didn't have anything to do with making the protocol or I didn't know what the activities were going to be. And the short version of the double blind testing was they did two or three activities, but this example is the one that's most known to people is where she was shown a picture and I was shown a picture. And sometimes they were the same and sometimes they were different. And I didn't know which I was blinded to it. And all of the answers were based on photographs that I had seen and not oh. what she had seen. And during that activity, I started, I figured it out what was going on. And I started noticing in my own head, I wonder what picture she did get. Was it the same or different than mine? And I call these breakthrough moments where I was really all of a sudden aware that the communications were maybe not what I thought they were. And that actually helped me later on pick apart what could be happening from a facilitator's point of view. So based on that test, there were like three or four different activities and all of the activities were based on information that I had. So they were either based on guesses or that the answers were gibberish or they were based on information that I had. And since that point, there have been many studies that came after mine Oh. Or around that same time, it, this was 1992. So remember, in the United States, facilitated communication was only two years old. And the studies were just coming out. And the studies that happened around that same time happened the same way that mine did. So one of the first ones in the United States was from a center called the OD Heck Center in New York. And they were their facilitators were trained directly from BIC at Syracuse University. And they didn't have any false allegations of abuse, but they wanted to know what was going on with their clients. I think they had seven facilitators and they matched 
the best facilitators with the most successful students so that they could have the best results going in and coming out of the testing. They wanted to give everybody an opportunity to show that this worked. And the same thing happened with them. All of the information that came out during those testings were based on what the facilitator saw and not what the client saw. And this has happened over and over and over and over. There's never been any study that the facilitator is blinded that shows that the facilitated communication works. It's very rare to say 100%, but this is one of those cases. The proponents have testing that they claim proves facilitated communication, but the facilitator is always part of the testing process. They know what the protocol is going to be and they can guess or they can they can figure it out. They can control um, the communication still. That must have been very traumatic for you though, when you realize that you have been deceiving yourself as well as everybody around you. You must have been shaken to the core with that. I was. It, it was very traumatic. And I, like part of the reason why I do some of the work that I do now is to provide a support network for people. But at that time, there wasn't very many people in my situation or that understood. Fortunately, like the scientists are demonized in FC workshops, but the scientists were the ones that helped me understand the situation. And they still, I'm friends with them, some of them still, and they still answer my questions. They're very generous with their time and trying to figure this out. But it was traumatic and it still actually gets me. I just saw Jason Travers as a professor and he just did a workshop on facilitated communication. And he showed the clip from my story was on front prisoners of silence, which came mm -hmm. out in 1993. And they showed a clip and they show some of the messages that came out through the um, DHS interview, the, the accusations against the family. And I just started crying. It's very traumatic. And even 30 years later, it's, it's just, it's so sad that I, I it's not sad that people get caught up in it because I think that they really want to, that it comes from wanting to help out, but it's sad that the universities are still promoting this just like, even though they know that this massive amount of research is out there disproving facilitated communication and they still, they don't care. They still, they still promote it. And that to me, that, that drives me in terms of trying to speak out about it, even though it's a deeply personal, it started from a deeply personal place. But the other thing that was happening is because of my willingness to speak out against facilitated communication fairly early on, I kept getting reporters that would call me and say, we're going to, we're going to talk about your story, whether you provide us with information or not, with a comment or not. And I was like, okay, if my name is going to be involved with this thing, I better learn about facilitated communication, why it doesn't work, or if it does, maybe it works for other people. Maybe I was the bad facilitator that didn't, which is what the, I think they use my situation in the FC workshops is a bad facilitator, but, but I was like, what is the science behind it? What is the language? What are the reasons why it doesn't work? And what about unexpected literacy skills? Can that happen? And that kind of thing. So I, it sent me on a journey of learning, really. No, that, I just, uh, that is quite a journey to get to be on. Actually, I, it reminds me of conversations that I have watched or programs that I've watched with James Randi where he's trying to expose, say, fortune tellers or uh, other people who claim to have supernatural powers. And this is, of course, this is not this is not supernatural in any way, but they go through a very similar process where you have fortune tellers, palm readers, people who claim they can see these things, and they really believe that they can read palms or that they can tell a person's future because, of this, just this bias going in, which then gets confirmed every time you get a hit, you get all the misses. And of course, all the people who are coming to you are probably believers as well, who are also counting all the hits and forgetting all the misses. We can create entire careers, which are based on this bias. But of course, there are people who know very well that they don't have any supernatural powers that they don't possess any such skill to be able to tell a person's future or past or to see into their lives or contact the dead or anything of that sort. But at the same time, they carry it on because this is 
the kind of it not only gives them validation but they get a lot of money <laughs> from performing these acts do you think there are people in the facilitated communication field who are doing this knowing that they are not only exploiting people who are unable to protect themselves from it but also exploiting their families and their friends and their fellow students etc do you think there are people who are purposefully doing this to deceive everyone just for a living that's a tricky question yes i do i think the whole movement not to test facilitated communication mm. is based on keeping facilitated communication alive i just read a book called a strange sun by portia iverson and portia iverson was responsible for bringing one of the leaders of it's now called rapid prompting method but she started in india and she sponsored her to come over to the united states because this facilitated communication seemed to be working with her son who was profoundly autistic are you talking and, about shoma um, mukhopadhyay yes i am Okay. And so her she knew about facilitated communication. So what she Soma has done is she has invented a new form where the facilitator holds a board in the air and the person who's being facilitated points. They they say it's without physical contact, but that's questionable. But it looks like the person to an onlooker it looks like the person is pointing by themselves to the letter board rather than having somebody hold them at the wrist like this. And two times in that book This is a the, this book was written in 2006 I think it was published it, and I'm not sure exactly when the testing took place but the so Soma's husband realized that she was doing facilitated communication with their son and confronted her about it and she got mad and continued to use it and so he took Tito as their son to mm -hmm. lunch and then when they got back from lunch and they were by themselves Soma wasn't with them they asked questions about what happened at lunch and he couldn't answer the what happened so that was a blind test that was that is if soma didn't know the answer then the communication wasn't available mm -hmm. and so she started this technique of she calls it test then teach where she would read a little paragraph and then the person would answer questions about it but she's the one that's facilitating so she knows both the answers and the questions that are being asked a couple of years later Portia was trying to get all these specialists in the United States to see their point that Tito was this genius all of a sudden with facilitated communication he supposedly had an IQ of 185 which Whoa. you know yeah they were trying to get him tested so that it would become rapid prompting method could be mainstreamed when soma left the room for a minute one of the assistants read tito a paragraph that she didn't she was not aware of and then when she came in she came back in they asked her questions he couldn't answer any of the questions so that's two blind tests at mm. two different times and they, they the fc communication failed both times but they didn't stop there she continued to use it they started making these rationalizations so she can only answer questions about facts and not about personal experiences which is it doesn't a lot. make any sense it's a, it doesn't make any sense <laughs> he couldn't tell them what he had for lunch but he could talk about the gaza strip because soma and so the whole book in my opinion i've got a couple reviews coming out on the book i couldn't stop it just one the whole thing is about rationalization and wanting it to work and i don't like the, in, in Portia Iverson's case she's the one that sort of egged soma on Mm -hmm. and got funding so she could stay in the United States and that kind of stuff. She had a profoundly autistic son that she had trouble accepting that diagnosis and, and didn't want that for her son. And so she really wanted him to be able to communicate. I don't think FC is a communication technique. I think it's a coping strategy mm -hmm. mostly for the facilitators. And most a lot of the facilitators are parents of children with profound autism. And they really want their child to say i love mom and dad and now in 30 years we there are people who are graduating from college 
using facilitated communication as their primary form of communication. So that sets the bar pretty high. The, I read a, a newspaper article, I think it was last year, there was a there's a 14-year-old in Florida that, that wants to study internal medicine at Harvard University using facilitated communication. And I just don't know how that's going to work. I don't know what the logistics are, but people are taking this seriously. They're well, mainstreaming... So the facilitator would definitely be able to become a doctor afterwards. <laughs> yeah, you hope that. And the thing is about facilitated communication, a lot of times the clients are not even looking at the board. You don't even know if they know what a letter is or how to spell a word. You mean, there's, they don't even, there's no test for that. And they have people facilitating and they're looking away, like beyond peripheral vision and they're typing and the facilitator's accepting that as a real legitimate typed out message. Yeah. In your presentation, I saw there was, I think there was one child who actually had uh, their eyes closed completely. They weren't yeah. even looking at the board. No. Uh, and uh, it's really heartbreaking to see. And, but just to be the devil's advocate in a way, sure. some might say that why not do this? Even if it is in pretense, it gives people hope. I don't know, honestly, who would think that? But I'm trying to put myself into the position of someone with biases who yeah. says that one way or the other, there this might be a way to coax a nonverbal autistic person to actually develop speaking skills. Maybe that at some stage it is them who is talking, even though it has been refuted scientifically. What would you say to people like that? Yeah, I would say that the problem with facilitated communication is that the facilitator, it builds dependency on the facilitator. So there's no point in facilitated communication. Even the ones that they claim are quote unquote independent, there's small, there's small cues happening between the facilitator and the person being facilitated. So if you if you remove the facilitator from that setting, even if the person has been using facilitated communication for a number of years, now some of them going on 25 or 30 years, their ability to type drastically reduces when the facilitator isn't in the room. So the problem is that the, it's not that like with legitimate augmentative and alternative communication, it's called, there may be some guidance and some cueing at a certain stage, but that is removed. And so if you take the assistant and have them leave the room, the person using augmentative and alternative communication could still produce written language or point to pictures or however the, the system is set up, this eye tracking devices and that kind of stuff. But that doesn't happen with facilitated communication. It only works when the facilitator is around. I think that some parents might find comfort in that, but what's happening also is that there are journal articles coming out. There's books and movies coming out that are supposedly representing the feelings and the thoughts of people with autism, but it's all based on facilitated communication. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice if those were the person's individual thoughts, but the likelihood that it's being controlled, at least to some degree, by the facilitator is pretty high when, the, when you're using facilitated communication. Of course. And these organizations that are training people, there are established organizations that are doing such things, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so why are they continuing, even if it's been established that this is a practice that is not only useless, but also something that is deceptive and potentially harmful? Why are they still around? I, because they don't, they've been able to convince the administration that it works and that they believe that it works or the marketing is that it works. And you're a lot of people who speak out against FC are accused of being ableist or against individuals with disabilities, which is also a lot of baloney, but it's a feel good. Yeah, politically correct position to take that FC works and you're allowing these individuals to reach their full potential. That is incredible. So is there anything that, so I also wanted to find out more about autism per se as an affliction, as a disorder, a disability is, do you have expertise in that field to an extent? It's not my field, but I've talked to, I can answer some questions about it that I have people who are in that field who 
have I've been working with, so I have a, a limited understanding. It's quite a big political debate at the moment about autism and the spectrum and who's representing who and all that kind of stuff. And there's a section of the autism spectrum that is are people who are severely disabled mm. and they tend to be nonverbal. They tend to have aggressive behaviors and impulsivity. Mm. So they might bang their head. They might run out into the street without looking. They might grab food off people's plates, that kind of thing. And, and those are the people who are susceptible to facilitated communication. And it goes from severe to mild forms of autism. And so the more verbal you are, the less likely that you're going to be a candidate for facilitated communication. Although there are some people who do have verbal ability, limited verbal abilities that are being subjected to FC. And in those cases, they're, the facilitators trained not to give a lot of stock to their verbal behavior, but focus on the typed written out behavior. And there is something called echolalia, which there's debate about what use that has, where somebody might repeat a phrase that they've heard or that kind of thing. But you have to figure out in the situation what the meaningful messages are and what the echolalic messages are. And usually it's pretty clear. There's a movie called The Reason I Jump, and it's a pretty popular movie. And it's based on a book that was written through facilitated communication. So the narration in that movie is facilitated words. But there's a segment in that movie where somebody's being facilitated. She's saying, no more. Can we go home? Expressing those thoughts. And her behavior is a little bit agitated. But mm -hmm. the mom is facilitating with her. And they're, she's typing out something completely different than like all of a sudden we could, I forgot exact, the exact words, but like all of a sudden we could communicate together or something like that is what the mom's saying. But the individual being facilitated is saying no more. Can we go home? I don't want to do this. And in that case, I would say that her words are pretty meaningful because they matched her nonverbal behavior as well. Okay. But do we understand at this stage what part of the brain is affected by autism, which causes the symptoms of not being able to speak or not being able to behave appropriately? Or do we understand what's going on in the person's mind? And is there any way that we have to truly understand what they're thinking hmm. in a genuine scientific way? Yeah, I don't know that I know the answer to that completely. I know that they, it's a neurological disorder and part of profound autism comes with communication difficulties i'm i'm not the i'm not the best person to answer that specific question that you asked but yeah i think they do have clues they have clues about for example in order to learn language early on there's something called joint attention that is if i'm gonna if i'm gonna teach you that that this is a cup like i have to you have to look at this when i'm making those noises to understand that this is the thing and these are the sounds that i'm making cup and this is the thing that those attached to, you with. know, it's not a pen, it's not a dog, it's a cup. Anybody who's learning language has to associate, have to make that eye contact with that thing and know that you're the person who's teaching you that thing is an important, something important is happening. I need to pay attention to that. And with people with autism, profound autism, their, their joint attention skills are greatly reduced so they miss those opportunities mm. to learn language so there that's one example and that would also interfere with learning reading skills and writing written language skills too you have to you have that joint attention is a really big mm. issue because the reason why i ask is because i also i have friends who have an autistic son and from their perspective i know that there are lots of parents who do have autistic children or and the I'm just trying to find out if there is a legitimate way to understand and communicate with autistic people in a way that is true and meaningful. The uh, the most effective and evidence-based communication technique or learning technique is called applied behavior analysis. And that's where they break things down into small steps. And it's very, it's methodical, but it takes a long time and Unlike facilitated communication, where they have some of the facilitators claim 100% success rate with ABA, there's not always that 
high of a success rate. So even somebody who works with ABA but has profound autism, it, it may or may not have the degree of success as some of the other, like any of the other techniques. That's really the that's really the one that's evidence based and long term that works. I see. So what are the what are the clues and the cues? You had mentioned this in the beginning, but I just want to have this reiterated that if parents are approached with this with this method of communication, with facilitated communication, or you could also please give us the other names it's called by. If they are approached yeah. by this, what how can they detect? that this is facilitated communication, it's not real, and that they need to go elsewhere to find help for their child. Yeah, it's evolved. They've changed the name on purpose. I have an article that that documents that they've changed the name. I don't know why they would tell anybody in public, but they did. And I've got it where they've changed from facilitated communication to supported type to quote unquote fly under the radars. Syracuse University used to have the facilitated communication institute. It's gone through a couple different names. I can't remember the current one, but they've changed it on purpose. So supported typing to communicate, informative pointing, rapid prompting method, spelling to communicate. I don't know. We've got a list on our website. There's 20 yeah. names. It keeps changing yeah. uh, because the American Speech Language Hearing Association came out in 2018. Since 1994, they've had an opposition statement against facilitated communication, but they added rapid prompting method. And so now there's even more names because they're like, oh, we're not using rapid prompting method. We're using motor planning communication something or other. <laughs> As I'm speaking, they're probably making up more names for this technique. So some of the cues that what I recommend is that people focus on the facilitator and, and notice that the interference like that the facilitator has over the communication technique. Now, if they're using a legitimate form of like augmentative and alternative communication, the assistant might say, I'm using hand over hand with this person, but only for a week or two, because I want them to understand like the motion of a letter or mm -hmm. that they'll tell you, they'll be upfront about what they're doing. But facilitators tend to be a little bit more cagey about what they're doing. One thing about holding a board in the air is that the board moves uh. inadvertently. And the facilitator probably won't notice that it's moving because they're interacting with the client. And so the person's trying to point and the facilitator say, I need a, say, I want him to point to the C and my fingers over here. The facilitator might move that board over a little bit just so that person can touch that C. Uh, the other thing to think about is the facilitator might nod their head. They might shift in their chair. To, to be more present, they might give hand signals, they touch, go up or down or over. They might change their vocal inflections. So at the end of a sentence, they might go down or at the beginning of the sentence, they might go, if they want the person to continue spelling out a word, their voice might go up. What else? Oh, when they're holding, definitely when they're holding on to their, the wrist or the shoulder or the elbow, sometimes they'll, they'll tug on their shirt sleeve mm -hmm. or the really tricky facilitators will tug down by their waist so that it's out of camera if you're watching something on a video of successful facilitated communication it'll be down where you can't really the camera's up here mm -hmm. and it's down like in a sneaky place where they're tugging I on their shirt in a couple of videos <laughs> where i was like she doesn't seem to be holding his hand she doesn't seem to be touching him in any way but he's still whacking away at the letters what's going on there that's probably it because it looked very convincing yeah yeah um, the, just... uh, another thing is yeah, the other cues can be very small i was just watching soma for example i was mm -hmm. watching some of her early videos and her cues are huge she's like getting him to point and her hands are like this now all she has to do is this and people are like, she's moving her hand a little bit, but there's no way that he could possibly be typing. And it's like, yeah, he's following her cues because the other thing that happened with Soma was that I learned through this book is she only paid attention to him when he was facilitating. 
So she's only reinforced those behaviors for oh, however God. old he is. And he was big too. He was, he actually was violent and he would go into people's homes and wreck, pull things off shelves. And he choked Portia Iverson and his mom had to pull him off. And he wasn't learning any other behaviors except when he was facilitating with her. That's the only time she reinforced him. Um, and you talked about some of the dangers, yeah, some of uh, the dangers. Like he needs to, he may, somebody with profound autism may always be impulsive, but they need to still be taught. You can't just choke somebody. Like, that's not all right. I mean, it's it boggles the mind as to why she is doing that to her own son. And maybe even knowingly. I have a, uh, this is an idea I've had. I've been reading pro FC books. As frustrating as that can be, it's taught me quite a lot about facilitator thinking. And there's two cases that come to mind. One, one in her case, and this is according to Portia Iverson, the second hand, but she came from India and she came from a community that was afraid of Tito's behaviors. And, and then this, the other case was in The Reason I Jump and they were in Sierra Leone. And mm. those parents actually talked about their child was being called a devil and they were being called witches because of the strange behaviors and the sounds and he wasn't verbalizing and that kind of thing. And I thinking about FC as a coping strategy, in those situations, if somebody could type out poetry or write a book, or there may be some survival component to make people look a little bit more neurotypical. Yeah, he's got strange behaviors, but he can talk about the news and he can talk about politics or religion or do high math skills or that kind of thing. So part of that coping strategy may also be like how as a culture or many cultures that we deal with people with profound autism, yeah. I still don't think it's right, but I think that the origins of some of this may have come out of a need to have people look a little bit more neurotypical than they really are in real life. That is understandable though. That is understandable. Thank you so much for bringing attention to this very problematic practice. Are you doing any speaking appointments or are you, how are you spreading the word about this? Yeah, occasionally I speak to groups uh, like the Skeptical asked me to speak a little bit and sometimes classroom teachers will ask me to speak about facilitated communication. The most that I'm doing that takes most of my time is I've got a co-founder of a website called facilitation.org and there we've listed controlled studies systematic reviews, organizations with opposition statements. We also have pro FC articles on there that we've critiqued. There's two of us regularly, and then there's others that contribute. We have a blog that we put out every Wednesday. We usually have some sort of information about FC. There was just a court case that happened in Pennsylvania where the parents wanted to get spelling to communicate into the school system and the court turned them down. And what I thought was interesting about that court case was that the parents wanted to provide supplemental information to the court to show that spelling to communicate worked, but they inadvertently did a double blind test in there. The student and facilitator were doing some activity and it wasn't going very well. So the facilitator asked for the answer key to activity they were doing. And once they got the answer key, all of a sudden, all the answers were correct. So the judge was like, I don't think this works with this purpose. <laughs> they lost their lawsuit, but I think they're going to appeal it. So anyway, occasionally we get people who are still false allegations of abuse happen. And over the last couple of years, I've had people contact me about that and we try to hook them up. So I have a bunch of experts that help me out and I'll send people to the right person or hopefully somebody that can help them out so that's a lot of my work goes towards that kind of educating people wonderful and do you have if any of the viewers have any questions or maybe if they've encountered this sort of some form of facility to communication where can they reach you on twitter email address something that you'd be comfortable sharing yeah the the website has a email there that's probably the best place to to make sure that i actually get the like sometimes on social media, I don't always see things that go through um, yeah, my feed. Facilitatedcommunication.org 
And then my email on that is contact one at facilitatedcommunication.org. But there's a there's an email, right? If you go right to the website, you can get me right through the website. Yeah, I'd love to I'd love to hear people if people have questions or concerns or maybe there's a maybe there's a study out there that I haven't seen that proves FC works. I'd love to read that too. I haven't found one yet, but there's always hope that it could work at some point. Absolutely. If it is even plausible that it would, but I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't personally think it is. We but... keep that one percent open to something that might actually flip us over, and that was makes that will makes good skeptics. Yeah, there's a part of me that would love for it to work, but it's just like the evidence is so clear about what's happening. It like physically can't. It can't work. You can't have a system that builds dependency on another person and then think exactly. that it's independent. So just the whole structure of FC, it, it just, sorry, it, it can't work. It just can't. Yeah. As much as people hope that it will, it just can't work. But it is certainly a very attractive prospect. If it really did work, it would be an amazing thing, which is why people be- gravitated towards it. And that's why people would, because parents, I'm sure, would love for their child to have finally have a voice. And it would be phenomenal. If I was in that position, I would do anything, move heaven and earth to be able to speak to my child. Yeah. But yeah. it's just, it's not that easy and it's not that simple. But yeah, no. thank you very much for joining me on Rationable. I will, I'm certainly going to have you on again if, uh, if I get enough questions put in the comments. Sure. I'll put all the links to either your website, to your talk at Skeptical. And as well as the other video link that you shared with me about a two-hour presentation, which goes through facilitated communication and its problems, which I also found very illuminating. I haven't gone through the whole thing yet, but it's... Yeah, no, it's a long talk by Jason Travers, but it's worth... uh, He goes through some of the history and some of the reasons why from a psychologist uh, or he's, he's an autism specialist. Mm. So from his point of view, it's always good to get varying points of view. Absolutely. Maybe I'll have him on board to tell us more about what autism is as a neurological disorder and maybe get some insight into that as well. Thank you so much again. Thank you all for watching and being here on Rationable for watching the video. Thank you, Janice, for joining us. And if you have any questions, drop them in the comments and I'll put all the details of how to get in touch with Janice in the description below. Until next time, thanks for watching and bye.